not all franchises are created equal or at least not developed equally or marketed equally but what if they were could they all be blockbusters let's talk about it The story of a monkey's paw came first from a short story by author W.W. Jacobs back in 1902. The concept goes that you can use this monkey's paw to make a wish for something amazing, but there is always an associated cost. It's safe to say that as far as quality control goes, Nintendo games have a higher batting average than those from a lot of other companies in the industry. It's rare to see a game developed or even published by Nintendo come out completely broken. However, as a company with so many IP to balance and with between 10 to 20 published games out each year of the Switch life cycle at least, several games a year seem to have financial and timeline constraints that lead those games to not being everything they could really be. Let's start with some examples of the monkey's paw in some of Nintendo's own releases. In each of these, there's a great opportunity for real breakout success. Take a recent example, Mario Strikers. The game is gorgeous, the gameplay is deep, fun and interesting, and the multiplayer can be really fun. By all accounts, it could be a blockbuster release. Especially especially next to soccer games as popular as FIFA and Rocket League, each of which are endlessly popular with the added star power of Mario at the helm. But with the oversight of poorly implemented online co-op play, where a full four on four match would require eight players to be playing two per system across specifically four different switches. This kind of thing can make up the difference between mild success and the 13 plus million cells of Splatoon 2, which does feature a standard 4v4 online mode. And additionally, many would point out for Mario players who don't enjoy multiplayer, but would pick up the game otherwise there is no notable single player mode which could hold it back as someone that tends to be on the other side of the spectrum i'd say what's missing is a breadth in the multiplayer content that is there sports games tend to air closer to fighting games in the sense that the playtime comes from improving at the game and playing with others rather than one and dunning a 10 to 20 hour campaign but either way you slice it as with mario sports games this isn't a question of a broken game or lack of polish it's one of reduced scope when we talk about games being blockbusters this is often at the heart of it one of the most amazing things about the legend of zelda breath of the wild is its insane and unapologetic scope with no details left unturned and in cases like that of fire emblem three houses where the polish is lacking from time to time the execution and dedication to the scope robust gameplay depth of characters and dialogue options in addition to the story options more than makes up for it. Considering a blockbuster isn't just about total sales numbers, but sales respective to the potential for a genre among other things. Although this isn't always indicative of scope as we see with Super Mario Party, the best selling game in the series by a country mile, but just like with many Mario sports games, achieved the limited vision it's set out to accomplish and nothing more. Is this a blockbuster? In in terms of sales, well, yes, but in terms of fan reception and long-term recognition, as well as benefit for the franchise as a whole, maybe not. It certainly benefits Nintendo to have so many game releases that are low impact to create in terms of resources, but sell like games that cost many times more those budgets to create. But there's something to be said of the huge returns games that do the opposite make. Like sure, Call of Duty costs a ton of money to make, but the return on investment for these games is still much higher than a game like Mario Party. And I don't even mean relatively. Whether we want to admit it or not, the investment AAA studios continually make in games like this garner droves of dedicated fans that return every release because they know they're in for a product that the company making it invested a lot of resources in. Unlike many of Nintendo's low budget franchises that more often than not tend to have more of a revolving door of people growing in and out of their games. I think if Nintendo paid more attention and dedicated more resources to these franchises,
franchises, they'd have similar results with a lot more retention. But enough of missed opportunities. What true untapped potential does Nintendo have? And what could we wish for that Nintendo could avoid the monkey paw on? A question that's been asked several times in the Q&A segment of our podcast directly to you, which you can check out in the links below the like button, is some variation of, since Nintendo likes to give their own twists on genres, what's one they haven't tried? Usually, our simple answer is the over-the-shoulder third-person action-adventure game, and what franchise is better suited for that than the barely ever historically third-person action-adventure series? Star Fox. We've gone into what this would look like gameplay wise in this video but the long and short of it is the star power behind Star Fox is in the characters themselves as they have been constantly popularized by the likes of Super Smash Brothers. This franchise is a great example of how Nintendo has often narrowed their vision a bit too much around what Star Fox is rather than what it could be. Going back to scope rethinking that here could turn this franchise from one with a bit of an identity crisis where its most popular release was a great arcade game nearly three decades ago to an industry renowned legendary title worthy of all of the game of the year awards you can think of and to be honest scope will keep coming back here take arms a completely different kind of game the first game sold really well for the first entry in a new fighting game franchise at 2.56 million a number that puts it in the top 20 best-selling fighting games of all time across every platform. A second entry could easily allow this franchise the room to really make waves in a whole new way. The core concept and mechanics and execution of each of these was incredibly solid. The biggest thing the next game needs to accomplish is to afford players the option to tailor the gameplay to more styles to play. Make it easier to use for competitive play by allowing for more streamlined access to what is currently an excessive amount of unlockable arms, and most importantly, maintain and reward its core base via support for the competitive scene on at least a similar level of Nintendo's other esports friendly games like Smash Brothers or Splatoon. These are the players that both invest the most time, money, and effort into the game as well as them being the most likely pathway to continued growth through word of mouth. Secondarily, as with many interesting Nintendo concepts and properties, there's a whole contingent of gamers who want to try out this new IP, but may not be that big on multiplayer. This is again where Splatoon and Super Smash Bros. succeeded in yet another way. Predominantly multiplayer games that gave single player focused gamers a reason to buy in and leave no potential fan behind. For an ARMS 2, some huge additional success could be gained with the addition of more new characters some guest characters, and even a small story mode that can work largely as a tutorial, again, like in Splatoon. But not every franchise needs to change in ways like new modes to be its best possible self. Donkey Kong, for example, would do well to return to a well it's left dry for decades and make the jump to 3D. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze is often spoken of as one of the best 2D platformers of all time, and with good reason. However, its difficulty as compared to contemporaries such as Mario games and the lack of a true new game in the series since its release on the commercially failed Wii U means that this great ape could still be destined for much more greatness. With the return of 3D platformers and the first in a long time that 3D Mario is outselling 2D Mario with Donkey Kong given a truly great release at the caliber of Super Mario Odyssey and proper marketing alongside release timing, everyone could enjoy this big monkey shenanigans. We actually have a video in the works for a whole gameplay concept for a 3D Donkey Kong game, so subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see that when it goes up. It begs the question why any franchise ever would be less than what they may deserve to be. For one thing, it might be that Nintendo's vision of a franchise really is that it is small, and they develop and market it exactly in that way. On the extreme end of this, which I'd agree with their assessment on, is a budget franchise like Box Boy or Push Mo. These are, in fact, games that are intended to be smaller, cheaper, and just fun little experiments. The absolute most extreme example is Jump Rope Challenge, a tiny game during quarantine made by just a couple of people trying to use their time effectively. It's just a small game where you jump rope, you 
using motion controls and it's a free download. To this point, at least, are there some franchises that Nintendo sees as small, but maybe they shouldn't? For what it's worth, Nintendo seems to be working on shifting some other franchises up that totem pole, as we saw with the increased production and scope of Kirby in the Forgotten Land as compared to some prior releases, Luigi's Mansion 3 even compared to other games. And lastly, to Fire Emblem and Xenoblade Chronicles 3, when Nintendo wouldn't even publish the first Xenoblade in the West just over 10 years prior. Other times though, the thing holding back a franchise isn't anything within the game itself. It could be timing or something more specific. In 2011, the 3DS launched and shortly thereafter in 2012, Kid Icarus Uprising released to great initial success. But after coming out of obscurity to launch with an incredible game, but on a slow start of a console and an awkward control scheme, this game remains something of a lost gem. However, this game does do exactly what was talked about. The primary mode is an incredibly deep single player adventure. It's got wit and personality along with fast paced action and vistas but also boast an online multiplayer mode that's original and similarly complex. In essence, this game has it all, including incredible potential. Other times though, the thing holding back a franchise from blockbuster status is taking a whole step back and thinking of a different approach. If we look at some of the most popular games of the early 2020s, these would be Fall Guys, Among Us, and Fortnite, among many others. These games promote multiplayer, but in a very different way to Nintendo's typical philosophy. Philosophy. Some of their games do have easy drop in and drop out multiplayer, which is nice, but looking at these three examples, one huge commonality is easy drop in, drop out communal multiplayer. Splatoon is probably the best example Nintendo has of this. It is very easy though to imagine a free to play Mario Party with a rotation of tens of small boards, dozens, maybe hundreds of mini games, and an easy way to play with friends and random users alike. Frankly, they kind of did create a good baseline for this and mount mini games in Mario Party Superstars. But this good idea is somewhat kneecapped by being hidden behind a menu in a $60 game. But in short, Mario, Kirby, Yoshi, Splatoon, or a bunch of other gaming icons could helm the next big multiplayer cultural phenomenon. And Nintendo stands to gain a lot from getting this right. A quick scroll through any streaming service's top viewed games will show you that the most popular games in the world, both in player base and viewership, tend to be multiplayer, often competitive games and Nintendo has shown that their properties can invade this space when they're not even trying to. Hell, often trying in vain not to. Figuring out how to get esports right in Nintendo's own way could very well have them plastered right next to or even above the likes of Fortnite, Call of Duty, or even League of Legends. Again, if you just check the Twitch directory during the grand finals of any major Smash Bros tournament, you'd know that they've already flirted with the idea. To be fair, they actually seem to be baby stepping in this direction with the latter example, if their partnership with Esport Org Panda has any indication. We just need them to fully commit and they'll be off to the races, I'm sure of it. As a blockbuster game, selling a lot of copies of your game is great, but it should really be a testament to the game's quality rather than the other way around. The real goal instead is for every game that Nintendo makes to be given the time to be the best game that it can be or should be. Of course, this isn't always realistic, but oftentimes when a game is delayed to ensure its best possible outcome, examples like Breath of the Wild, Luigi's Mansion, Fire Emblem Three Houses, and Animal Crossing New Horizons come to mind, these games find their success and are titles that are fondly remembered for years to come. Sometimes corners will have to be cut, like Game Freak often has to do with Pokemon to keep up with the marketing machine that is their brand. But as often as possible, if every game Nintendo makes is one that they can be proud to say that it's the best version that it could be of itself, that's a win for everyone, including for Nintendo's pockets. What do you think? Leave your thoughts in the comments or at me on Twitter. If you want to support this channel, check out our Patreon to see if any of the available tiers are a good fit for you. If you want to hang out with the community, our free to join Discord server is linked in the description alongside that and all of our other their social media accounts. Above all, subscribe to Redirect and ring the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Okay, that's it for me. See you in the next video.